What does it mean to be a leader? Like if you had to sum it up in one word, what one word would you use? Maybe authority, maybe like commander, um, power maybe, are some of the words that come to mind when you start thinking leader. When we think leader, we think someone who is firm and in control. They're harsh, but they're fair, right? That's some of the things that come to mind. They're not afraid to make the tough decisions. Uh, those are the kinds of things we think about when we think about leadership. We talk about toughness. We talk about uh, forcefulness. Today, you can probably throw self-promotion into that mix as well. They're, they're good at drumming up support for themselves, when we look at Jesus, though, we get an idea of what true leadership looks like. If he's the king of kings, if he's the king that all other kings will bow to, if he's the lord of lords, he's the lord that all other lords bend their knee to, then, then he's the boss of bosses, right? He's the ultimate example for us of what it means to be a leader, and so last weekend, we saw that through his words and his actions, that he's Lord of the Sabbath, he's Lord over Scripture, he's Lord over sanctuary. Anything you can think of, Jesus is Lord over that. Anything sacred, Jesus is above and beyond that. And so this weekend, what we're going to see in Matthew is a little bit of commentary by way of Isaiah about who Jesus is, and about what it means that he's Lord over everything. And so we ended our passage last weekend with the Pharisees conspiring to kill Jesus. We're going to pick it up again this morning in verse 15. It says this, Jesus, aware of this, this being that the Pharisees are plotting to destroy him, Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there, and many followed him. And he healed them all and ordered them not to make him known. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. So him healing people and then telling them, don't tell anybody about this, fulfills this prophecy from Isaiah. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench, until he brings justice to victory, and in his name the Gentiles will hope. And so Jesus is aware that the Pharisees are out to destroy him, and he leaves. And not only does he leave, he tells the people that follow him, like, I'm going to heal you, but then don't tell anyone about this. He's working against building his reputation, which is something in our culture, in our age, that we can't fathom. He's like, don't tweet this, <laughs> but... Don't put your new hand on Instagram. Like, don't do it, because people are going to know, and we're trying to keep a low profile here. And Matthew's going to say, look, this is the fulfillment of what Isaiah was talking about in Isaiah 42. This is what he meant. And so we've seen Matthew before quote different passages from the Old Testament, give different references that happens all throughout Jesus' birth story, right? If you can remember all the way back to last January, not this past January, but the one before that, if you were here then, we talked about sort of the birth story of Jesus around that time, January, February, and we saw how there's all of these prophecies that Matthew's sprinkling in. He likes to do that quite a bit, but this is the longest one he ever gives. It's a full three verses with a little tag from verse four. Normally, he keeps it short and to the point. Here, he's giving us a whole big section. And one commentator calls this a God's eye view of Jesus and his ministry. We get this overall sense of what he's doing, about what he's all about. Matthew looks at the ministry of Jesus, and then he looks back at Isaiah and goes, aha, here it is. Here it is. in this one section, we can see everything that he's doing. So what is it that he sees here? What does this teach us about Jesus? What does this teach us about Jesus as a leader? 
What does this teach us about leadership, period, right? Because if we understand that Jesus is showing us the perfect vision of leadership, then we can take this definition and hold it up to any other leader we're evaluating. So you can take this to the office. You can take this to a job interview. You can take this to the voting booth. You can take this idea of leadership anywhere that you go and see how well they stack up because this is what leadership means. And so if Jesus is markedly different than other leaders, well, what, what's it mean? What's he look like? Well, the first thing we see is that Jesus leads humbly, right? He won't quarrel in the streets. You won't even hear his voice in the streets. He doesn't quarrel, doesn't cry aloud. You don't hear him. And also, what's the first word that's used here to describe him? It's what? Servant. Behold my servant. See, as far as Jesus is concerned, the word servant and the word leader are synonyms. We might not necessarily think that in our culture today, but that's what the Bible is showing us here is that servant means leader. If you're leading people, that means you're serving them, not that they're serving you. We're used to, you know, it's good to be the king, like, right? And the boss gets to sort of make the rules that benefit him. But what we see here with Jesus is that he doesn't come and demand his own way. He comes to serve other people. That's what the kingdom of God looks like. He even says this explicitly at one point. In Mark 10, 45, it says, For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so that's one way that Jesus leads humbly, is that he redefines leadership. Service is leadership. Another way he leads humbly is he's not trying to build his name and become famous. We have a culture that obsesses over fame. Remember when you used to have to be good at something to be famous? <laughs> <laughs> like you used to have a skill or something, like pro sports stars. Yeah, they're really good at sports. Musicians were good at making music. Now there's people, like if I go through the supermarket and I see a magazine and it's got someone on the cover or it's talking about someone and I don't know who that is, I'm like, yes, I win today. Like, <laughs> I do not know who this person is and I feel great. Like, imagine if aliens came from outer space and they asked us to explain the Kardashians. <laughs> How many sentences do you get in before you just feel ridiculous? Is it one? <laughs> is it even one? I don't know. Jesus is so far from the opposite of this. He warns people, look, don't even tell people about what I'm doing here. Isaiah says he doesn't quarrel, he doesn't cry aloud, he doesn't fight verbally or physically. He's not trying to drum up publicity. He'll contend with the people that confront him, and we saw him do that last week. But he's not seeking that out. He's not trying to provoke his enemies until it's time for him to die. He sort of picks his shot. The Pharisees are out to destroy him. What does Jesus do? He never swings back at them. And see, leaders of large movements of nations, they tend to be used to getting their own way. They're forceful. They take the things they want. If someone's got to get in their way, they're going to run them over. If someone disagrees with them, they're going to shut them down. Messiahs don't retreat. Messiahs advance. That was the understanding. Yet what does Jesus do? They start plotting against his life and he withdraws. And what's interesting is that Jesus could have saved himself by miracle, right? They could have started, we're going to stone him, and they pick up the rocks and they throw them and they just bounce off him and he doesn't feel it. They'd be like, what's happening? He could have done some miracle. He could have done anything. But instead he just uses normal means. He just walks away. He gets out of there. This is not the Messiah that the Pharisees were expecting. They expected a conqueror. No one expects a humble Messiah. That's an oxymoron. They're expecting someone that's going to, yeah, where he's going to come in, he's going to rally the troops, we're going to take back our land from the Romans. It's going to be awesome. They all expected a lion, 
But first he comes as the lamb. They expected a zealot, and what we get in Jesus is very different. Jesus is so different, you don't even hear a voice in the streets. You don't even hear it. No fanfare, no publicity, no hype. He doesn't come to draw attention to himself. Instead, he tells people, hey, don't even spread the word about this miracle that I've done. It's the exact opposite of how you expect someone to start a movement. Now today, if you're starting something new, it's like, okay, got to get the domain name, got to get the Twitter handle, got to start getting the word out there. Jesus comes, he doesn't do any of that. And if you drill down, the difference here is humility. Jesus leads with humility. But think about that. Jesus leads with humility. This is the one that everything was made by, everything was made through, and everything was made for. Like, we don't like it when people act like the world revolves around them. Jesus is the one person that can say that it is true. I'm holding everything together and this is all mine. I made this all and it's all for me. And Jesus comes and leads with humility. It's amazing. And we've seen that humility all throughout Matthew's gospel. He's not born in a palace. He's born surrounded by animals in a feeding trough. He goes to John and says, you baptize me. John goes, what? No, you got it backwards, Jesus. He goes, no, no, no. John, you baptize me. This is the way it's got to be. He goes through temptation just like we do. He puts a lid on people spreading the news about him. When someone acts like the world revolves around them, we know it's false. But here with Jesus, it's true, and still he leads from this place of humility. Everything is made for him. We are all here to serve him, and yet he's humble. And so how much more should we be? So when we start looking at leaders around us, we start looking at leadership roles, we got to look at them and see how close we come to Jesus. It could be any kind of leadership role. Maybe you manage employees. Maybe you manage volunteers. Whatever that looks like, lead with humility. Men, we're called to lead our families. Lead with humility. Parents, you're called to lead your children. Lead with humility. What does it mean to lead with humility? Well, it means that you put the benefit of others above yourselves. This is what Paul says in Philippians 2. Start in verse 3. He says, Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's exactly what we see in our passage this morning. Paul's just preaching the message for me here today. Look at the example of Jesus and do the same thing. Count others more significant than yourselves. What does he say that we should do out of selfishness? He says nothing. I did the word study on this. Paul uses for that word nothing, he uses the word me dis. And you know what it means? It means nothing. Don't do anything without thinking about others around you. And so that may mean that you give up certain things. For example, I personally do my very best to never talk politics in person or online. Certainly never from the pulpit. I'll talk about justice issues because I don't think that's something that should be drawn among party lines. Like racial reconciliation is a gospel issue. So I'll talk about that. 
Justice is justice. Justice please the Lord. Uh, and there are other ways that works out. And I believe that's a gospel issue. I'll talk about abortion because I believe that's a matter of life and death. Uh, I'll talk about net neutrality. It's kind of a weird one. But uh, most people don't understand it, but it's so vital to spreading information, which also affects our ability to spread the gospel. So I'll talk about that one. Similarly, I'll occasionally chime in on First Amendment rights because that's one of the things that makes this country so great uh, is that we need to protect it so that even if someone I detest is saying something I think is deplorable, still think they should be allowed to say that. Uh, There's a whole lot of things that don't fall into those categories. And in the past eight months or so, uh, there's a lot of opinions I've had to choke down. My tongue is bloody, if not quite severed in two from all of the biting it has endured lately. There's a lot of things I want to say, but I don't. And my former pastor, when I was in D.C., Mark Batterson, did a phenomenal job of this. I mean, a church in Washington, D.C., you got to be real careful about what you say and what you don't say. Uh, And was able to learn firsthand from him how to sort of ride that and just stick to the Bible, stick to the gospel, and not get lost on sideways things. The reason I don't chime in is because my role as leader of this church is more important than my opinions. Leadership means humility. Leadership means sacrifice. And that's one way that that sort of works out for me. If Jesus... If Jesus can come and lead humbly, then surely I can do the same thing. I can make sacrifices as well. I can count others more significant than myself. And the reality is, I don't get the chance to offend someone with the gospel if I've offended them with my politics first. And so, leading with humility, it means you lead from a place that acknowledges your limitations, that you are not God's gift to humanity, that you do not have all of the answers. Paul in Romans 12.3 says, For the, by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. When you lead with humility, you know your strengths, you know your weaknesses, and you lead accordingly. When you lead with insecurity, you challenge anyone and anything that might possibly have something negative to say to you. You refuse to admit you were wrong. You always look to pass the blame. A humble leader is a leader that's not afraid to say, yeah, I blew it. That's the way that God's called us to lead. That's the way we should judge leadership around us. So the first way is that Jesus leads with humility. The second way that Jesus leads here is that he cares for the lowly. Isaiah says he won't break a bruised reed. He won't quench a smoldering wick. What does that mean? Well, let's start with the reeds, right? So that plant, according to the book Plants of the Bible, which is a book I didn't know I had until Friday, uh, (laughs) is commonly called the giant cane. So it's this long, tall, hollow reed that grows up, grows tall in marshes, easily overgrows things. Uh, It's the original measuring stick. So a lot of the times in the Bible where you see that, well, we'll take a measuring rod and measure this, it was that plant that they had cut to specific lengths because it was brittle, but it would stay straight. And so you could kind of use that to measure different things. It also would get turned into pan flutes, which are like those little flutes where you get all of the like sticks in a row and you bundle them together and you kind of, you know. Uh, Today, we use the same plant to make reeds for woodwind instruments. So I played the saxophone in fifth and sixth grade. Um, Those reeds are usually made out of this plant now. But what's important here is that normally, this is a pretty fragile plant. Like, this is a plant that you could just, you just grab it, you can snap it in two. It's not that big a thing. So a bruised one of these, like the wind might knock this over and break it in two. Yet Isaiah points out that Jesus doesn't even break a bruised reed. Then we move on to the wick. So it's the piece of flax, right? 
that's in a candle or in a lamp. And if it's smoking, that means it's not working properly. You want it to just give you a nice, strong flame. So if it's smoking, it's like, man, this thing's not working. So what do you do? You snuff it out and you throw it away. Flax is cheap, even back then. We just get a new piece of flax. No big deal. Snuff it out, toss it, put a new one in. We're good to go. But Isaiah says, Matthew shows us that Jesus doesn't even dispose of faulty wicks. He's not even going to throw those out. He keeps them around. The point is that Jesus takes the time and the care to help the bruised, to help the hurting. The down and outs are not turned away by him. He preserves until the end to see them through. We saw at the end of chapter 11 two weeks ago, right? Where he stands and makes that declaration. If you're weary, if you're tired, come to me and find rest. Come to me and be refreshed. Jesus as a leader isn't just looking for the best and the brightest. He doesn't get mad because we're slowing him down. Jesus is the Savior of failures and little people. He's the one who stops to comfort and refresh. Psalm 145.14 says, The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. When we're falling, He catches us. He picks us back up. He doesn't just steamroll over us and keep going. He leads with gentleness. He leads with kindness. And so for us, we should lead the same way. We should lead sensitively. Whatever leadership role you have, don't run over people. Lead with gentleness. Lead with kindness. Don't get easily frustrated with people. Don't give up on them. Be patient. Be gracious to them. That's how Jesus leads, and it's how we're called to lead as well. Men, lead your families the way Jesus leads us, with compassion and with kindness. Those are not traits for the weak. They are demonstrations of great strength. Domestic violence is a serious problem around the country, but especially so in Wisconsin. I was looking at some numbers. One in three women, one in four men experience some form of domestic violence in their lifetime. And now it's important to note that domestic violence is not just a physical thing. It can be verbal, can be emotional, can be financial, can certainly be spiritual as well. And so last week, I was meeting with a domestic violence um, professional. And I was struck by how large the problem is, not just in America, not just in Wisconsin, but in our little corner of northeast Wisconsin. And so what I want us to do this morning, as we're talking about leading with compassion, leading with kindness, I want to talk about this. Because I know this is sort of one of those things that, oh, well, church doesn't really go there. But I think we have to go there this morning. And so I want us to look at something that sort of spells out what this can look like. Now, obviously, we all know what physical abuse looks like. You hit someone, you grab someone, you throw something at them. We know what that looks like. That's pretty obvious. But there's one of these resources that I was given that I was checking out that sort of uh, helps us better understand the problem and what it looks like when those things are part of the mix. And so this is the power and control wheel, is sort of what they call it, right? So when you're in a relationship that's unhealthy, where power and control are being lorded over the other person, are being used against them, These are some ways that that can look. And so the first way that that can look is with intimidation, where you have threatening looks, threatening gestures, threatening words. You destroy property to try to take control away from that person. There's emotional abuse, 
That looks like humiliating or ridiculing your partner, playing head games with them, not taking responsibility for any of your actions when you do that. Third thing here is isolation, where you control what your partner sees or does, when you limit who they're allowed to talk to, you limit their outside activities. Then denying and minimizing, where you make fun of the abuse, you try to play it off like it's not that big a deal. You don't take it seriously. There's using children, where you make your partner feel guilty about the children, you criticize your partner in front of the children, you tell the children that your partner doesn't love them. There's privilege, you treat your partner like a servant, you dictate the roles in the relationship without their input. There's economic abuse, so you prevent that person from getting a job, or on the other end, you demand that they work long, hard hours. You tell them that, uh, that they don't have access to family income. And the last thing is coercion. You make threats and maybe carry them out. You threaten to leave, you threaten to make false accusations. And now this isn't a cycle. It's not like you start at one place and it goes all the way around. But when abuse sort of happens, these are the things that in that relationship sort of keep that power and that control pressing down on the partner that's being abused. And this is not what God wants our families to look like. And so here's what it should look like is that intimidation you replace with non-threatening behavior. You talk and you act in such a way that your partner feels safe. Emotional abuse that gets replaced with respect, where you listen non-judgmentally. You value your partner's opinions. Isolation is replaced with trust and support. You support each other's goals. You Respect your partner's rights to their own thoughts, their own actions, their own activities, their own friends. Denying and minimizing, you replace that with honesty and accountability. You accept responsible, responsibility for your own actions. You communicate honestly and openly. Using children, you replace that with responsible parenting. You share responsibilities for the children. You demonstrate for the children what it means to grow up in a nonviolent home. You would be amazed at what children pick up, even if they're not seeing it firsthand. They know much more than you think they know. Privilege gets replaced with shared responsibility. You mutually agree on a fair distribution of work. Together, you get together and make decisions about the future. Economic abuse turns into economic partnership. You make money decisions together. Both people benefit from financial arrangements. Coercion and threats turns into negotiation and fairness. You look for mutually satisfying solutions to conflict. You have a willingness to change or to compromise. And the reason we're talking about this this morning is that Lakeside, we want to be a refuge for women and for men because we saw the numbers one in four for men. We want to be a refuge for those who need shelter and support from abuse. At the same time, we also want to be a place where men and women who have been abusers can come and repent and be transformed by the gospel. We want both of those things here. And so resources like this are really helpful for us to nail down what this looks like. And Scripture speaks to this a great deal, but I think there are some common misconceptions about what it's trying to say. I was hearing these stories of these women being told, well, the Bible says this by either their husbands or their pastors to minimize or justify abuse. So my attention, not my intention now, and I'll just lay it right out from the jump, is I'm going to make that look like Swiss cheese by the time we're done here. Flip over to Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to start all the way up in verse chapter 15. 
we're starting all the way far ahead because we've got to have some real context here for what Paul's saying. So starting in verse 15, he says, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. And therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk on wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves him, his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, and hold fast to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ in the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So we started pretty far ahead because we've got to have all the context there. The verse 21 says what? Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So everything we're reading here is framed in the context of mutual submission. We're all supposed to submit to one another. So what Paul's doing then, when he starts talking about marriage, then he'll go on to parenting, and then he'll go on to servants. It's all wrapped around this call to mutual submission. This is not one-sided Paul starts with the wife's role in the marriage, and she's told to submit to her husband. Then Paul says that the husband is the head of the wife, like Christ is the head of the church. Now, unless you can tell me what that means, I really don't care what your opinion is on the first part there. When Paul says the husband is the head of the wife, that's not something held over the wife. That's an extraordinarily high calling for the husband. Being head of the wife means taking on that role of servant leadership in the home. It's providing leadership. It's providing protection. It could be providing financially. In our modern economy, I don't think that always has to be the case. I'll say this. If the wife is working and the man is able to work, nothing's stopping him from working, and he just refuses to work, I feel comfortable saying he's abandoning his responsibilities there. But, on the other hand, if both the wife and the husband are working and the wife makes more than the husband, I don't think that's some distortion of what Paul's talking about here. That's an economic reality he could never have anticipated. That just wasn't the case where he's at now. And so when a wife submits, it's not about being told what to do. It's glad affirmation of her husband's servant leadership. And so Adrian and I discuss all big decisions together. And almost always at some point she verbalizes something like, I trust you. And that means the world to me. That's a window into what Paul's talking about here. And what's also important for the wife is that her submission is balanced with all of these other ways that she's commanded to submit. She also has to submit to other believers. She has to submit to the elders of the church. She has to submit to the government. She has to submit to a boss at work, perhaps. Most importantly, she has to submit to Jesus. And so any submission to her husband has to be balanced with those others. So if her husband's trying to make her trying to lead her in a way that leads her away from her submission to the Lord, 
she has a responsibility to disobey, to refuse to do that. And Paul gives way more information into the husband's role than he does the wife's, and I think that's important. Paul says that husbands are commanded to love their wives like Christ loved the church. What does that mean? Well, the example Paul gives is that Jesus gives his life on the cross for them. And then Paul says, husbands, will love your wives like that. Love your wife sacrificially. Like we've already covered this morning, love her humbly, being more invested in her gain than in your gain. Love her compassionately, never seeking to break her or snuff her out. Put her needs above your needs. Put your, her wants above your wants. That's what Christian marriage is supposed to look like. That's the very definition of love we're given, right? And first, John, this is how we know what love is, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's the model. Like, that's what we're commanded to do here. And then Paul gives another example that goes all the way back to Genesis. The husband and wife are one flesh. These two different, separate things come together and be one new thing. And so, husbands, when you sin against your wife, you sin against yourself. You wouldn't hurt your own body. Why would you hurt her? And I'll go a step farther. Failure to do this is disobedience. Failure to do this is, in a word, sin. This is what we're called and commanded to do. And so as I was hearing these stories, it was making me so mad because this is the reality. If you have to say, well, the Bible says you, ha you can't leave me, or the Bible says you have to listen to me, if you have to say that, men, you've already abdicated your responsibility. Like, you've already blown it at that point. Also, important to note in our passage this morning, Jesus flees to save his life. Now, I don't imagine a scenario where I would advise a couple to get divorced, but that doesn't say anything about a woman leaving and getting shelter for her and or her children like, you can leave and get distance and try to reconcile that relationship from afar without being under the same roof. If a situation gets physically abusive, I'm not an expert, but that would be my advice. And so our leadership anywhere, especially in the home, should be a kind, gentle leadership. One that doesn't roll over the weak, but holds them up that's patient with the broken, that cares for those who need it. And so this Isaiah passage that Matthew leads us to, it touches on Jesus' humility and his compassion, but it also, in that God-eyed view sort of way, it shows us the hope that he brings with him. Jesus brings hope. That's the last thing we see in this passage. Now, Israel originally interpreted this passage as being about the mission of Israel, the nation, as a whole. And then eventually, over time, they start thinking, certain scholars start thinking, well, maybe this is about the Messiah. And then Matthew's like, he knows what Jesus has done, and then he goes back to Isaiah, and it's just like flashing red lights. And he's like, this is it. This is exactly what Jesus came and did. Jesus is the servant of God that leads this way and does these things. Matthew translates from the Hebrew here, but he uses an interesting word. Because there's a word in Greek, the language he's writing in here, that just means servants, diakonos. Maybe you've heard that before. And so he could have used that word, but he doesn't use that word. And then there's another word that sort of means slave or servant called doulos, and that's what Whenever Paul says, you know, I'm a servant of Christ or I'm a slave to Christ, it's doulos. Maybe you've heard that word before. He doesn't use either of those words. He uses this word pace, which means servant, but also sometimes it means son. And I think he intends the ambiguity there. Does he mean servant? Does he mean son? I think Matthew's kind of playing with the audience there. Like, I think he means both. Here's the servant who's the son of God. 
who comes and is going to bring hope to all of the nations. And when you think about it that way, this passage starts to sound kind of familiar, doesn't it? Right? Back in chapter 3, Jesus is baptized and a voice from heaven says, Behold my Son whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased. When we get to the transfiguration, God again will say, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And so this one that Isaiah brings up here, it's slotted almost right in the middle of those two. Just again and again, Matthew's reminding us, this is who Jesus is. Jesus is the Son of God who's leading people back to the Father and will lead the Gentiles to him as well. Jesus is going to bring the whole world into the love of God. He's the name that we can hope in. And he says he'll bring justice to victory. And that victory was won on the cross. That victory was announced at the resurrection. That victory is being worked out through human history. And one day that victory will be finished when he returns. And so for all of us this morning, in light of that victory, we can put our faith and our hope and trust in Jesus if we put our hope in Him, that He lived and died and rose from the dead, that He paid the price for our sins and threw them into the abyss, never remembering them again, if we do that, that's where we find true rest. That's where we find true life. And that's where we follow the true leader. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the incredible example that you have set for us. First of all, Lord, I pray that you would give us the faith to pursue you to accept this gracious gift that you have laid out for us. That you would build hope in us. That we would long to see you and know you. And that you would strengthen us, Lord. That you would give us wisdom to lead like you lead. And whatever areas of our life that looks like, that you would help us to follow your example. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.